So we're going to be talking about high performance Python microservice communication. A little bit about me. I'm Joe Cabrera, as you just heard. I'm a software engineer, currently at a startup in New York called Handshake. I've been a Python programmer since 2009, so really love Python. And I'm also an author on various open source Python projects. I always put a picture of something I enjoy doing, so in my spare time I enjoy drumming. So I decided to put a picture of a drum set. Okay, so things to consider when we're designing our microservice communication layer. Obviously we want to think about speed, we want to think about reliability, security, uh, learning curve. So whatever communication layer we're going to design, is it easy to learn, to set up? Is it easy to debug? Obviously, in most cases, we'll run into a problem where we'll need to debug something, so it needs to be very easy to debug. And then is it easy to fix? These are a few things we're going to consider. So let's start off with one solution we could use. We could use traditional REST. You see this in use in a lot of different microservice communication layers. Um, serialization and deserialization are obviously expensive. It's decently reliable. It's HTTP, so no reason why we would assume that it wouldn't be unreliable, right? It's pretty reasonable. Um, it's pretty secure. There's several authentication schemes we could choose. A lot of them, you don't have to roll your own. There's several that exist, you know, for Python. Uh, Django REST framework, you are familiar with that, probably. RESTful, RESTless, the list goes on. There's predefined status codes. So this is nice, you don't have to worry about error states, it's pretty well defined what an error state looks like and you can communicate that between a server and a client. And obviously, the learning curve is pretty easy on it. There's lots of resources, it's, there's great frameworks built around it, and it's human readable. So this might be useful for debugging and we don't have a fancy tool, we don't have Wireshark or something that can debug it. And obviously, it could still be plain text, so it's pretty easy to debug. So what about RPC? Well, the one that we're gonna be talking about is gRPC. It's six times faster. Same reliability as REST. It's more secure. There are several authentication schemes for it. And obviously it's difficult to decode without the actual schema, since you're really designing your own from scratch. Uh, the learning curve is a little bit harder though. There's not as much documentation on it. Still in the very early days, so you'll have to roll a lot of this stuff yourself. And it's obviously not in plain text, so it may be harder to debug. Also, it supports duplex streaming. So REST only supports singleplex, so you can have the, the server and the client talking at the exact same time in duplex. So that's advantageous to us. Also, it has support already built in for HTTP2. Why is this awesome? Because HTTP2 is a fully binary protocol. It has multiplex streams. There is priorities and dependencies. So if we have one packet and we want it to say this packet relies on this other one or it needs to get there before another packet, we can specifically flag that and it'll get there. And since it's fully broke a protocol binary, all of the packets are the exact same size. This is different in HTTP 1 because in HTTP 1 it's all based on words and so the packet size may be like different. There's header compression. This is the fastest expanding thing right now for any calls made is that packets and the headers specifically are very large and very long, and so there's specific compression in HTTP2. There's reset streams. So if you have a connection open, you can send a message through, through that says, go ahead and reset this connection without actually tearing down the connection. It's nice. And it has server push. This is an example of what your syntax would look like for a gRPC. 
So for this example, we're going to have just a very simple message. It's just going to be a person. They're going to have a name, an ID, and an email. And you can specify specific fields to be optional or required, along with what type they are. So here's an example of how we would use gRPC and Python. You go ahead and design your spec, and then you use the gRPC compiler, and it will spit out a file that will be in the format of underscore pdb2. So you just import that object in. You create your object. So in this case, we're going to have person. You associate individual pieces of each of the fields with what you set up. So we have a simple ID, a name, email address. And then once we're ready, we've added everything, we go ahead and do serialize to string. And now it's put in its binary format, and it's ready to go across the wire. So it's very, very easy to use. OK, so let's say we don't, we don't have support for HTTP2 within our framework. Django is an example of this. There's only a few frameworks right now in Python that actually support it. Twisted is one of them. And then there's also, you can, this is where I was back to what I was saying, where you can roll your own. You may have to roll your own in some cases, because in a lot of cases, there's not really any support for it. So say we were going to be using Django or any one of their other RESTful frameworks, like Django REST framework or RESTful. We'd have to design our own endpoint for it. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward how we would design this. So we would just import the gRPC file, create the person, and then just have an HTTP response and just serialize the string. There's a couple other pieces to this, but we'll come back to it. OK, so the only example that I have for G gRPC over HTTP2 is in Twisted, because like I said, that's the only one right now that supports it. So one important thing to note about this is that gRPC and since in this case we're going to be going over HTTP2, the HTTP2 spec does not specify that you have to have um, a secure TLS, but there's no major browser support right now for anything that doesn't have TLS on it. So it's kind of built in, which is nice. So we're just going to create a server, assign it a private key and public key, and start it running, and serve the same information. On the other side, when we're receiving it, on the client side, we need to use a library called Hyper. So this is, you may be familiar with Request already in Python. Hyper is basically the same as that. It's pretty much the only library right now that supports HTTP2 connections. So we would just create our Hyper HTTP key connection, do a GET request, and get the response. And then whenever we're getting the information back, we just need to call parse from string. And this just decodes the message. Notice that we had that optional field there. And so there's a special function that you can use to check and see if that field exists and read it only if it exists. OK. So say we want to put in place a very small authentication layer. Um, this might vary in your setting, right? Maybe you're connecting on the open internet. Maybe you're connecting within a VPC. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, but in some case, you're probably going to want some kind of authentication to make sure that one microservice is talking to the other one, and you verify that that is actually that microservice talking to it. One very simple one that we could design is one with JSON web tokens. Very simple, easy to use. You just generate a token that's for a specific time. You send it down the wire, and then you can just check on the other side. So this is a very simple example of one that we could create. We're using the library called PyJWT. It's a very easy library to use. It allows you to make web tokens and have them encoded and decoded, and make it, makes it very, very easy to use. So we'll just create our payload and have our secret key, super secret. 
And there's a couple of different algorithms you can choose for it, but we're just going to choose HS256. We encode it, and then we just can set it as an authorization header and send it down the wire. Then on the other side, we're going to decode it, also with JWT, and just check the response. And if it matches, then we go ahead and just continue receiving the message. Again, you could design a much more complex one, depending on your circumstance, but this was a very easy one to do, because in this use case, we didn't want to have any passwords to be able to log on to each machine. This is a very easy way to do that, but again, you could design your own. And have a few resources. Again, links to the JSON web tokens site, Pi JWT, GRPC, Twisted, Hyper, um, the spec if you care to read it, and then a more thorough example of HTTP2 explained in a much easier way. I want to show you a quick example of some of it in action. Okay. So just for reference, in case you were curious, it creates this, this is that file that I was telling you that it creates. It's pretty com like complicated, it's not really interesting to read. I want to make, make it bigger. Yeah. Oh yeah, let's see. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, it's, you don't ever need to edit this at all. It's created directly by protobufs. Here's our example. And so I've just created the, started the web server. Oops. And then let's fire up Postman. And let's test against this endpoint. And we got a response back. So this is what it looks like when it will come down the wire. It's in, it's not decoded. This is in like the binary format that we have. So we would need to go ahead and wire up a very simple client for it. I had an example here, but okay, we're just gonna stick with this. Yeah. So you would just you could just set up a request object like normal and just have it received and then call the decode on it. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. You want to have any questions? Um so I think you alluded to this, but I probably um, don't have the full details. Um, like Swagger, where you can define the definition, you can make a, a framework or a library rather that can consume it for different clients. Is that the same case with gRPC? It, it looked like it was, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, you just create your, your spec for it through a syntax like spec for it to be received. Um, there's not really like any great documentation tools for it like Swagger. Right. You would just create your uh, proto file. Oh, okay. But yeah, it's still early days, so <laughs> right. these don't exist yet. Hi, uh, that doesn't look like gRPC to me. It looks like it's protobuf with a custom RPC or like protobuf serialization over REST. What is? What you showed. Oh, the example? Yeah, I mean, pro gRPC generates the, the server and client like yeah, you can you can you can have it. You could write your own. You could use the one that they have, 
in this case, I needed to put it into a framework. So I wrote, I wrote my own, essentially, for it. But is it using the gRPC RPC, or is it just using protobuf over? It's just protobufs over okay. like uh, HTTP2 or okay. HTTP, yeah. You mentioned the uh, kind of clunkiness with having with debugability, let's say, around these binary protocols. Do in practice, do people, if I wanted to be nice as a service writer, like expose both maybe JSON and protobufs with different content types, or does does no one do that? You just stick with one. Um, you you could do something like that if you wanted to. Obviously, you wouldn't get the, the the you know like the speed that's faster with the the JSON, the JSON side, but you could if you wanted to. There's no reason why you couldn't. Um, for sending content type, you could definitely do that. You could just send like a, a bi you could have it set as a binary content type, and just have it received in the same way. You can set a header for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, let's give another round of applause for Joe. <laughs>